Okay, how's everybody doing? So I just want to show you the plan that I'm building uh, this little skiff from. So it's from this publication, which is excellent, by the way. Some of you may be familiar with it, Wooden Boat, uh, the magazine for wooden boat owners, builders, and designers. And this is issue November, December 2001, number 163. Okay, um, this is a just a fantastic uh, publication. It's chock full of drawings and boat stuff, and obviously it translates to the model builder as well. Yeah, notice the bartender. Yes, ex uh, U.S. Coast Guard used these boats. They're plywood. They were unbelievable off the Columbia River, like the way they plane and could handle rough seas and everything. But anyway, the skiff plan is out of that issue and uh, you can see here that I just reduced it down roughly and then I'm using my HO scale model railroad reference rule to build it and I don't want to build this one it has a really neat plan and a little write-up on it like the writing is just superb in Wooden Boat magazine by the way um, hashtag no sponsor but they are just superb publication um, so if you're building especially in 148 scale or S scale uh, I want to build some of their boats in 148 scale because they're just beautiful. Um, but anyway, this one skiff, uh, the drawing has a uh, cabin on it. But I'm going to leave it off because I want this beach to finish the scene, the entry scene. This I want this beach by the pathway coming down. And I want you to be able to see into the boat, maybe a little bit of flooding in the back transom area here and some weathered uh, floor planks, etc., and a rope and stuff. Um, but, you know, the sky's the limit for what you want to do, right? And I don't uh, build super close to spec with NHO because it gets lost, right? You can see there's, like, this was a straight angle here and this here, like, instead of trying to introduce the curve, I just sand it in later with a sanding block, okay? But you can see that uh, I'm just adding the formers now. And then what I do is I just uh, find the main formers that run the square part of the hull. And then I just use it as a template for the other reinforcement formers. And you can see here that I've cut this one out. And uh, I put a couple of these bottom floor stringers in. I haven't put the keel in yet. But this is going to drop in... like this okay and then I've already cut like scribed this inner panel so I'm going to glue this in place first and then I'm going to pop that panel out that's a similar way that they do it uh, you know like on the one-to-one -one prototype uh, this is one method Okay, so uh, just want to show you this quick here. So this, uh, the uh, freeboard or the deck on the skiff, I just cut this out, the paper like this. And then I just traced it onto the plastic. In this case, 10 thou. This is obviously a little bit smaller than that, but you can see I usually just tape the pattern on. I, I cut the paper out and then tape it onto the plastic and then cut all the lines and then cut through the tape at the end. And then you get a pretty accurate piece. And then what I'm going to do is uh, just tag this on, glue it on one side at a time, and then clean up the edges uh, with a rub rail on the side. And not really sure how far I'm going to take this. I might just uh, leave it open like this and then uh, I'm going to knock this out because that's already scribed. It's just keeping it stiff for now and then I'm just going to throw an outboard motor on there and just have it beached and uh, yeah just weather it up a bit. Should look kind of cool and finish that scene on the river there by the trail that uh, comes down from the brewery. Okay, so uh, just putting a little bit of trim along the edge of the decking here on the boat just to help uh, kind of enhance, you know, the little bit of the shear on there. 
Okay, I was going to use half round, the really small profile that they have, but I don't have any, I'm out of it. So I thought I'll just use some 20 thou rod, it's small enough anyway. So I'm just glued the front, I sort of put a pre-curve on it and then tacked the front and then pulled the side down tight and run a bead, pulled this side down, did just chase it all the way along like this. And then uh, you know, I just work it down and just hold that, just let that capillary in a bit. Just a little bit of pressure just to tack it up. Uh, just I'll give it a light sanding later, but you can see how it kind of cleans that up, right? Okay. Okay, so just a little update on the progress then. You can see the skiff. Uh, I pretty well built up the hulls, pretty much done now. You can see I put the deck on. That, uh, I used 10 thou for the deck. Um, a lot of 10 thou and 15 thou on this. Basically, the, the sides and the bottom panels were 20 th or no, 15 thou, and then the top was 10. And then I used a really small 15 thou rod, or no, it was smaller than it was, uh, yeah, 15 thou rod for a little bit of the trim around the rub rail on the outside, and then a small 15 thou dowel for a trim around the, the cockpit here. and. I'm going to deck out the bottom as I remember the skiff we had as kids. I imagine these are fitted out 101 ways to Sunday, these skiffs. Some had cabins, some didn't, some were just open. So we had an open runabout style, and uh, even though it wasn't made of plywood like this one is, uh, the one we had was a clinker built, so it was tough as nails, right? You couldn't sink it really or break it. It was just beached. And when, of course, when it got beached, you couldn't use it because it was too heavy. You couldn't really drag it if the short if the tide went out really far. You'd wait till the tide came in. So, and then I'm going to build up a 50 horse. Uh, this plan calls for 50 to 75, but I believe the one we had was an old 50 horse Merc, two stroke, and uh, boy that thing really moved. But anyway, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use these little one by threes for the decking, and then some bench seats, and then um, I'll probably cover a little bit of the outboard motor. It'll just be more of a sort of symbolic rendition of a outboard, nothing too fancy there, it's only HO scale, right? Okay, so I got all the decking in and uh, I got this rear bench seat here and uh, I'll probably run a seat in the across the middle. Um, and then what I'm going to do is just uh, cut a template out for an outboard motor like this here. Um, I've already described this, so I'll show you what, uh, how I'm going to do this. And I'm just going to, I just cut the profile. Uh, it's just a simple profile from a photograph. I just sketched in on a few lines and then what I'm going to do is just build up the side of it like just bulk out this side and this side and then I'm just going to have it in there like that. Okay, so this is what I call the roughing in process here uh, concerning the outboard motor. So you can see I just basically packed it out. Uh, there's some half rounds there. You, I probably could have used a full dowel, but I wanted to build in this little fin with a stabilizer on it. And then uh, there's the bottom where the prop goes. So that's getting really small, right? So just something to represent that. And then you can see I just packed out here, laminated some plastic together with solvent to fatten it up. 
and then I'll just file it and sand it into shape. I mean, this will, this would do, but that's the beauty of scratch building, you know, uh, when you get into it, you can go as far as you want, okay? So you can sort of see, that's the idea, okay? Okay, so you can see the outboard motor, it's getting close. So here's the leg, which will go, I'll trim that and that'll just go on the bottom. Okay. And the prop is just some triangular stock, just glued on. And then I'll just trim it. I'll trim the corners off just to round them off with the nippers when that's cured. And then you can see the motor mount brackets cut there. Usually when I make these little pieces, I make one and then I just press it down on top of another piece and hold it and just trace it uh, with a number 11 blade. Just, just cut out multiple parts from the one part, like just by tracing it. Makes it a lot quicker and easier that way. So this one here is, um, here's a photo of the actual outboard. old mercury and then this here you can see this is just some detail that's on the uh, the outboard itself just trim that off It's tough to cover this little uh, build because the, your, your hands and the shadow just overwhelms it. But uh, so, so I got to do it in stages like this. So you can see that I've left this piece on here. Remember how I've, I've talked about that in the past about you sort of build your build these little parts on a sprue, right? So that was glued on to there like a strap that was wrapped around the engine and then pinched off. See? You can just see there where it was pinched in. But I'll leave that. And then this becomes the pivot point for these brackets here. Like I'll mount those brackets onto this tab. And then I'll just nip off the excess when I'm finished. And then it'll get mounted on the back.
Okay, so how's everybody doing? So before I dive into painting the skiff, I just want to share a couple of uh, principles or, or the style in which I paint quickly before I do, because I know people have mentioned in the past a couple of things like, why do you use, like, let's say 40 PSI? People say, oh, that's too high. I've had people say that. Okay, whatever. If it's too high for you, then don't use 40 PSI. But I use 40 PSI with my contractor compressor. I don't use hobby compressor, okay? I'm not going to get into that, but I use a real compressor with a tank on it. You can buy a good contractor compressor that'll last you 20 years for 300 bucks. The same price as one of those little tabletop vibrators that generate water, more water than they do air. So the reason why I use 40 PSI uh, in this particular case, or with cheaper airbrushes anyway, which is what I've used mostly throughout my career, is I'll show you why. So let's just say that uh, this is the orifice of your airbrush okay like this is the tip this is the cross section of the tip and then your needle sits in here like this all right okay and without getting technical the air and the paint comes in and when you pull back on the trigger it opens up the tip and your paint your atomized paint sprays out right that's just the basics of how it works. There's all kinds of technology and technicalities behind really high-end airbrushes for good reason. But I don't generally use one. I have some nicer ones than this, but I like this one because it does the job and it's reliable. And I can cheat with 40 PSI what I would need to use my other more expensive airbrushes for to try to achieve this at a lower PSI. So I like to use high pressure, low volume in this application because when when I use 40 PSI and IPA Tamiya acrylics, which dissolves beautifully, it's always cleaning the tip for one thing, the IPA-based uh, solvent. It's always cleaning the tip, okay? Because IPA is an excellent cleaning product. And I find that it atomizes the, the, the Tamiya paint excellent, right? Okay? Now, if I use 40 PSI, I don't have to pull back on the trigger. Like, I just have to think it in my mind, really, right? Like, there's the full pressure. That's 40 PSI. Okay. Now, because I have higher pressure coming in, I don't have to pull this needle back hardly at all because the higher pressure is going to push this paint through. Uh, if I lower the, the PSI with the same setting, it's going to start to splatter, or I'm not going to get the same solid stream that I want on the model. Okay? So I can basically cut a smaller line with a big fat tip. I'll just show you this tip. It's really nothing fancy. I don't know the size offhand. It's, it's a fat, I think it's a 2.0 or something. But I've actually sanded this over the years with 600 grit. Like I've no, really, right? Like you just polished it down. It doesn't bend really because it's not needlepoint, right? Which is why I can't stand those uh, needlepoint needles because they, you know, they basically bend when you look at them. Okay. All right. So I'll just put this piece back in. And when I slide in like that, I don't have to worry about it catching and bending like you would a normal needle. So when I uh, pull back on the trigger like that with high pressure, I get a nice, really nice line, right? And I can get in really close to the model. Like that's just air, but I can just think in my mind and the paint starts to come out at a high 40 PSI and I can cut really tight lines, get in close. I don't have to worry about splatter, okay? Or a wide, broad spray pattern. That's why I use high pressure, low volume paint. Okay, in this case, it's not a, a, a HVLP like a high volume, low pressure. It's a high pressure, low volume paint. And that's what we use mostly for our models anyway. But that's why I use 40 PSI because I can cheat this airbrush to perform a lot better. Now, the downside in closing is this because there's always a downside when you do things like this. If you're running this all the time, like on a commercial basis, you're going to wear the tip out a lot faster than you would if you just use like 10 PSI or, you know, 12 or something like that. Okay. 
because the pressure going through here, just like a pressure washer, or let's just say more extreme sandblaster, they have the, the uh, porcelain tips that wear out, but they do wear out uh, if you use higher pressure. But in the hobby application, you're not gonna notice it really in a way that would be cost prohibitive or anything, okay? So that's why I use 40 PSI. And the reason why I use IPA are some of the reasons I mentioned already, and I don't need a water trap. You don't need a water trap if you're shooting alcohol-based, ethanol-based paints because the IPA, as soon as you drop water into this, it's dissolved immediately. So it's not going to come out as water. It's going to come out as alcohol, right? Okay? Which evaporates water. All right? Okay, so this is probably one of the few times you'll ever see me shoot straight black, okay? See how I splattered first? I shot out any particles, any uh, residual buildup on the tip, all right? Just to get everything lubed up and the paint flowing nice so that I can get this kind of a pattern, see? That's it. That's about all you'll get out of this airbrush. That's all I need anyway for this. I don't need a smaller line than that. So I don't normally paint things like flat black, as I've mentioned, but in this case, this is a black mercury outboard. And I'm going to dust this over with some natal black and maybe a thin dusting of gray just to highlight it because it's so easy to do with an airbrush. You can make details pop on small parts like this, which you wouldn't want to paint by hand because you'll lose all the crisp detail that you built in, right? So, you see? And then I'll hit that with a natal black or a, a really dark gray and it'll just help highlight it a bit and help some of those details to pop, all right? Okay, so now uh, I'm going to start painting this boat. So what I did was is I just skim coated a little bit of white on the sides because it's going to be red, white, and blue. Yay. But um, what I want to do is, is I want to darken the inside of the detail here, the inside of the, uh, the deck, you know, these floorboards and up underneath the bow in there. And wherever there's, um, you know, cavities, I want to try to darken that. And so what I'm doing is I take some black and brown, about 50-50. I call it raw umber, which, but it's never exact, but you'll never notice anyway. But that's usually when you see me say raw umber, it just means I take flat black and usually linoleum deck brown. Okay, those two paints, flat black, linoleum deck brown. And I just mix them 50-50, like from the stock bottles in a larger bottle. I find too that if you use the thinner bottles, if you buy, buy the larger, you know, thin, to me, a thinner bottle, save those because they're excellent for mixing larger volumes of paint, etc. And then, so I don't want to use black because black is, is, is sort of, well, it's not even a color, right? Um, I don't mind it for shadow, dark shadow, pin wash kind of thing. I like to have brown in my black, let's say in this case, because it's warmer. It has a warmer uh, finish. So there'll be a bit of black left in here. But that's okay because uh, I'm going to shoot it up underneath. And because it's really thin, the paint, the advantage to really thin paint and again, high pressure at 40 PSI, I can get into those cavities. 
okay, without building up too much paint because I'm not shooting a lot of paint, right? It's very thin, and like I say, I'm only pulling back a tiny bit, and that high pressure is getting the paint back there where I really want it, okay? So if I shoot the paint and it floods a bit, well, so what? The paint's so thin, it'll just, it's like a wash anyway. And the IPA, which is 80% of the content per volume in this cup, let's say, is going to evaporate or dry and leave the dark residue. Okay, so what I did was I just took some Tamiya tape and I'm just going to tape off a waterline, uh, which is a little bit tricky on a hull like this because it's sort of a planing hull. And when it sits in the water, like the waterline would be underneath here. But I'm just going to run it up the front like that. Um, and just leave it the way it is. There's a little bit of indicator on the back there. So this would be white. And then the bottom would be red, I believe. I'm going to do a faded red and then a blue deck with a gray interior, kind of like this. I threw this together. Let me zoom out for a sec. I threw this together years ago when I used to build stuff like this, you know, in my shop. Like, like in film, we did this a lot because when there was downtime between models or sets or whatever, we would just throw stuff together because, you know, we're trying to keep busy and creative and stuff. And so... This is just a skiff. It's actually an East Coast skiff, um, an American East Coast skiff. And I forget the plan that I used for this, but really, like anyone can build a model like this. It's pretty simple. It's just flat plank bottom, see, the sides. And uh, I think I had a rudder on it. I must have lost that. And then there were oarlocks I made out of brass as well. The brass plates are there still. I don't know what I did with them, but uh, I still have the oars and uh add a piece of rope it's kind of cool eh? i used to fly fish in one of these when i was a kid you know uh, a lot of the lodges and lakes up in the interior had these because they just would sit out all winter and, and as long as they stayed wet they wouldn't leak <laughs> Okay, so this is just a very thin uh, XF12 JN Gray. I like JN Gray, and for smaller models, I'm not that particular. It's not like larger scale. I'm going to be more picky about color shades and and uh, tones, etc. But it's just a small little model. It's not going to make much difference. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lightly, from a distance, is just lightly dust. The inside. And you'll see what that does. See there? That's just the fundamental rule of light and shadow. Now you can build upon that. And this is why I like Tamiya, because I can lay this on quite quickly and efficiently with Tamiya acrylics, IPA based, and then this dries very quickly. And then I can go to start to paint this almost right away with other water-based acrylics, not alcohol-based though. You don't want to use alcohol-based after you've done this base coating because you'll eat through it. You want to keep this. That's why I used water-based Vallejo. You can use the paint of your choice water-based, but make sure it doesn't have any alcohol in it. And then when you start putting little washes and flooding in things and, and so on with the, you know, by hand, you won't cut this away. You won't melt this into mud. Okay, that's the idea behind that. And you can do that with the whole boat too. Like even when you do the top, like when I spray it with this blue here, I can come later with Vallejo dark blue and put washes and add chipping and, you know, whatever way that you want to do. Uh, like I say, with a small model like this, I'm just going to do it with a brush. But you can see that that just, just that alone is almost good enough, right? Because it's a support model, right? At 187 scale.
Okay, so we're going to add a little bit of blue. This is sky blue with a bunch of white I added. I like to tone colors down. Okay, and this is uh, probably a gloss, but it doesn't really matter. So I can flat coat it later, but I added a bunch of flat white to it. So, and like I say, I also popped the seat off because it's just drilled and pressed in and then the the uh, steering will pop that out because it just gets in the way when you mask it you're going to tear it off probably anyway so so uh, I'm just going to come in here like this is what I talk about it's a tiny amount of paint like this see see there watch see how I, you can't see it at first and then you hold it there long enough and it builds up see this tiny amount of paint it's going to be quite weathered so An old weathered skiff that's seen better days. See how you can lay it on really light like that? Just you can get in really close if you want. All right, see? See how there's hardly any paint going on, but the 40 psi is still pushing the paint out. All right, that's why it's not the fine line; it's the 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 high pressure, low volume that really allows you to do this kind of thing and to stay in control. Now there's all kinds of fade on there that I actually quite like. This is how I clean between colors quickly. Just blow out back, back flush. You wouldn't do that with expensive Tamiya thinner, would you? But you can do it with IPA because it stuff's cheap. Look at that, how it cleans, how fast that cleans up. Isn't that nice? Notice how I'm letting some of it run out a bit. I want that. I want the boat, to, the bottom, to look really ragged on this on this model. Even though you probably won't see it, it's good to practice those fundamentals anyway. Every model is a paint meal. <laughs> For me, it is anyway. And every once in a while, you get a good meal, but a lot of them can be pretty stubborn. Okay, so just a couple of things. So with the outboard motor, it's, it's, it was sprayed black and then a bit of gray. So I just want to point something out to uh, how I like to do pin washes, like dark black pin washes when I do use them. Um, I used to just add like gloss uh, to the black. I just find it flows better, but you can use this semi-gloss black by Tamiya X18. And the reason why I like it is because I can add water to this. Like I can choose, I can choose to add 
IPA when I shoot it through the airbrush or if I just want to use it for a wash then I just use water. You can use distilled water if you want but I ran out and just used tap water because the tap water here seems to be pretty good. It has a low mineral content but anyway um, if you're going to use um, uh, this as a wash uh, you don't want to eat through the underlying paint. Remember how I told you like if you take any IPA and you stab it onto a Tamiya painted with ice water it'll eat right through it. That has advantages though too if you want to do certain kind of weathering it lifts nice. But anyway so I just do that I take a little bit of black like this and I just add it in like that. Okay. And I can vary that right. Uh, like if I don't like it, I can dump some out. Oh, here I'll dump a bit out off camera here a bit. And then I'll add a little bit more just to make it darker. And then I can basically just put a wash on this Merc motor. Just to give it a little bit of a sheen and a, and a, a darker um, I don't know if you can notice that. But uh, it'll put a little bit of a sheen on it and that's what I want. Okay. So I'll just put that aside and that way the IP because this is just water it won't eat through it'll, it'll it'll sit on top and it won't affect it okay. Now I'm just going to play around here with the boat hull so you can see I've got just water here and a yogurt uh, tray which I like because it has the little trench around it with water. Okay and then since it's really hot today it's over 30 oh it's brutal here right now up in Vancouver west coast the August I'm in a heat wave but um, so so it doesn't evaporate too much I just have a rag here that's wet. Some people use foam underneath and wax paper and, and that's fine whatever uh, you feel comfortable with. Um, I think I'm going to uh, I don't want to waste too much time with a small brush right now so I'll just use this larger brush to get the job done quicker so I'm just going to put a bit of a rust wash over this uh, red just as a kind of a pin wash. Mind you you're not going to see the bottom of this really so a lot of painting too like uh, you want to venture off and try different things like some of you might notice like I'm not really like unless I'm doing a competition model which I haven't for a long time or for IPMS <laughs> oh my goodness um, then I don't really care right like I really don't you know <laughs> like I'm not trying to prove anything really I just want to have fun and I still want to keep learning so um, try different things remember how the bottom of that hull how it was really thin almost too thin and it sort of sprayed and you know it didn't look that great well it changes when you put washes on right another layer it's not going to matter is it okay Remember how I talked about the water line that I didn't tape? Well, it's going to be all weathered out and trashed from all the water and the beaching, so you can add that in by hand, um, like a remnant of it, right? So this is the wet on wet that I talk about. It's not a new technique. It's just an old. It's a it's a watercolor fundamental. Watercolor painting in a two dimension is one of the most difficult painting genres to master. And I'm no master at watercolor flats, that's for sure. But I learned it when I used to mess around with watercolor back in the day. And 
I learned that, uh, you know, the trick was to keep was like the surface wet, not flooded necessarily, but sometimes flood painting works too. But allowing the water against your solvent to work for you, see, you can see what it's doing, right? You can control the paint, right? In a way that is really quite remarkable for small scales, I mean. And it's another method you can add to your skill set or your kit, right? See, so I'm going to leave that. I really like that. You know how art, you how art is random, right? And it comes through practice. It comes with not trying to be too, like, think about it too much. But the water solvent method like this one and what teaches you that. It teaches you how to introduce anomalies that look like the it would in the real world. Okay.